Hey everybody, Crow back again, and I kind of want to start a new series, and this is a series about the Evercade and its games, and I kind of want to go over all of the cartridges that I wind up getting for the Evercade, and kind of going over all of the games in them, and what I think of them. So we're going to start first with the Atari Collection 1 with the Evercade. This is the one labeled as one. It was included in my premium bundle. It was uh, one of the collections I was looking forward to playing, and I actually played this quite a bit. And what I've done is I've played through all 20 of them, and I've given them a score, uh, one through five, five being a what I feel a great game and something that I really enjoyed, four being good, something I still enjoyed, but I feel could be improved in some ways. Three is an okay game and it really doesn't sway me one way or the other. Two uh, would be like a meh game. You know, it's a game that I only think is that good, but still some fun could be had with it. And a one is just plain bad where I, I'd say it's not good at all or it's just unplayable. And how I'm ranking this is just my own personal bias. It's what I feel. I'm not trying to grade these on what I think everybody else feels about these games. This is just how I feel about these games. And before I start, I want to say that these rankings are actually based on how these games play on the Evercade and not really how the originals play. Because obviously with the Atari 2600 game, you'd have difficulty switches on the original system where you don't have that option here. Not unless they up, do a firmware update or something. Something. And uh, you also don't have paddle control. Some of these games require paddles where they've been changed to where they don't use the paddles or not at all, as you'll see. <laughs> and then also we've got like the 7800 games where the reset button is one of the phase buttons. So possibly those could be things that change in the future. But uh, as I'm talking about these games, this is uh, firmware version 1.2. So um, bear that in mind. And we're going to start with Alien Brigade. All right, first up, Alien Brigade for the 7800 originally came out in 1990. I hadn't played this game before, and I started into it, and I was like, hey, I really like this. Even with the D-pad and not using a light gun, this turned out to be a really fun shooting game, and I, I really enjoyed it until I got to the end of the first level, and I was like, oh, I failed the first level? What didn't I do wrong? I got yelled at by the superior, and <laughs> I was like, well, what do I do? So I try again, I try again, and it took me a while to figure out that Oh, the helicopter at the end is actually rescuing the POWs. I'm not supposed to shoot that down. So as long as you don't shoot it down, you can progress to the next level, which I still haven't passed, but I still had a blast with this game and I'm gonna give it a four. Next up, we have Adventure for the 2600, originally released in 1979. And I know a lot of people really like this game, and it's some people's favorite game on the Atari 2600. Uh, for me, that's not the case. I've never really been too into Adventure. I mean, I get it. I know how innovative this game was for the time. It's just that I didn't have this game growing up and I really couldn't get into it. But yeah, it's a fun little game where you can you run around and you fight dragons. You basically looking for, I don't know if it's the Holy Grail. It's a glowy chalice type of thing. And you bring it back to your castle and that's how you win the scenario. I think every time you start it up, all the items are randomized. There's three difficulty levels with more complex maze. I personally have only been able to, to finish the first one. I, I get too, too bored, I guess, of playing the second one to, to want to finish. The only downside here on the Evercade is there's no difficulty switches, so you can't adjust how difficult the dragons are. You could always escape from them pretty easily. But yeah, keeping in mind that I'm not too into adventure. I'm going to give it a three, kind of an average score, just okay. Even though I know a lot of you would give it a five. I'm sorry, but I just have to give it a three. Game three is Aqua Venture for the 2600. I would say it was released in 1983, but this game was actually never released. This is a prototype from 1983. And you know what? I've never played this game and I think it's utterly fantastic. I, you basically are going down to the depths, uh, collecting treasure and bringing it up all while avoiding the fish, which can sometimes be harder than it sounds. 
Primarily because you could shoot the fish, but once you shoot them, they come back even faster than before. And you just keep repeating this until you die, run out of oxygen. There's a little turtle that's going across the screen. So you have to keep doing this faster and faster and uh, time really becomes an issue. And also it kind of becomes an issue is that your character's blue and sometimes the water's blue and it makes your character hard to see. But despite this flaw, I still gotta give this a five because I just had so much fun with it. Game four is Asteroids for the 2600 originally released in 1981. Basically a port from the arcade game. Of course, this isn't going to hold up to the arcade game, but you know what? Nostalgia is nostalgia. And this is a game I played quite a bit when I was a kid. And as I kind of grew up and I played it more and more, I realized that the asteroids seem to primarily stray vertically. They don't seem to go horizontal at all. They might go on a 45 degree angle in some instances, but they're truly not completely random. But even then, there's still some fun to be had with this, even if it's a bit easy. The only thing that really sucks is that there are 66 game variations and you have to look that up yourself because some of them are two player and obviously you can't play two player on the Evercade. Uh, but yeah, despite that, uh, once you've taken care of that, print yourself up a cheat sheet, throw it in the case or something. I'm going to wind up giving this a four, not a perfect game. And there are better asteroid versions out there, but really it's nostalgia, I think. Number five is Canyon Bomber for the 2600 originally released in 1978. This is a game where you take control of various planes that fly by and you drop bombs into the canyon below and trying to score as many points as you can. In one player games, you're playing against a computer controlled opponent, but in two player games, obviously you can't play two player because this is the Evercade. And I guess you're just playing to beat your own high score. Honestly, I've never found this game terribly interesting. Yeah, you could play it and go for a high score, but honestly, I'd rather play anything else. Now, the funny thing about this game on the 2600 is that game variations seven and eight are a completely different game called Sea Bomber. And this actually uses the paddle control and you're supposed to use the paddle to adjust where you want the bombs to detonate when you drop them. The problem is here is that the Evercade version kind of disabled the dial on the paddle completely. And that's fine for Canyon Bomber because it doesn't use the paddle, just uses a single button. But for Sea Bomber, you need that in order to control where you want the bombs to detonate. Otherwise, the game is impossible to play. So the Sea Bomber portion of this is completely unplayable unless they patch in the actual being able to control where you want the bombs to detonate in the future release or something. And because of that, this is going to get a two from me. I mean, I could give it a one, but uh, to be honest, there is some fun going for a high score in Canyon Bomber. Number six is Crystal Castles for the 2600, originally released in 1984. This is a port of the arcade game, which originally used a trackball. The Atari 2600 version uses the joystick. And that may be a problem because basically you play as, I believe his name is Bentley Bear, and he runs around the maze, avoiding all the monsters, collecting all the gems on the ground, or just dots. I think I don't know exactly what they are. I think they're gems or something. I don't know. Once you do that, you move on to the next castle, and so on and so forth. This is a game that can actually end. This has, has an ending. But the problem with the 2600 version is that unless you're lined up just right to get these dots, you can sometimes run around and miss a lot of them. There's a lot of missing of dots going around here. I do have this game in an arcade one up. It is the arcade one up that has centipede in it. So I've played it with the trackball and I'm still not a big fan of this game, but it is definitely more fun with the trackball than it is the joystick. I know this game has its fans out there. I'm not one of those fans, but ultimately I think I'm gonna give this one a three. Uh, because I don't think it's a terrible game. I'm just not that into it, so I just have to give it an average score. Game 7 is Centipede for the 2600, originally released in 1982. 
And one of my first thoughts was why put this version of Centipede on the Evercade when there's a 7800 version? But of course they saved the 7800 version for Atari Collection 2. But that's not to say that the 2600 version is a bad game. In fact, despite how it looks, it plays very well, even if you're stuck with a joystick or a D-pad, as opposed to the arcade's original trackball, this game is still fun to play. So yeah, uh, basically, if you're not familiar with Centipede, you are basically at the bottom of the screen, you're shooting centipedes coming down on you, avoiding other insects like spiders and there's scorpions to go across and poison mushrooms. This is a really good game. The only hindrance on the 2600 is the graphics. I'm gonna give it a four. You hear that? This is game eight on the Atari Collection One, and this is Double Dunk for the Atari 2600, released in 1989. And what you're hearing is the best part of this game. The theme song and the two dancing guys on the title screen are fantastic, I really like it. The game itself, I don't like one bit. It seems too difficult. Uh, maybe I don't know what I'm doing, but this is just, to me, it's an exercise in frustration. I always get the ball stolen from me. Um, you do have to have the manual to look, to, to plan your plays out, because before you start, you can select your offense. I think you select your defense as well. Um, and you need to know that, otherwise you're just gonna get the ball taken from you and dunked on repeatedly, like I was. And it, I don't know, I just think I would have preferred the original Atari basketball game compared to this. But maybe I'm just bad at the game. Uh, I still think I might come back to this and try it every now and again, and those dancing guys alone are what saved this from me giving it a one. So I'm going to give this a two. Game number nine is Desert Falcon for the 2600, originally released in 1987. And again, I was thinking, why not the 7800 version? And that's because the 7800 version is on Atari Collection 2. And that game isn't bad at all. That's fun. This game, I feel, is not that great. It's not that great of a port. Basically, you play a Falcon. This this kind of feels like a Zaxxon type of game with the isometric view. You could land a Falcon to jump and pick up power-ups, and then you fly up in the air and you shoot stuff. I can make it to the Sphinx at the end of the first level, but then I kind of gave up when I would get destroyed by it repeatedly. I don't know what I'm doing wrong, and I didn't really care to figure it out, at least not just yet. I do feel this game has some merits, but why just, why this one? Why not just put the 7800 version and forget about this one? I don't know. But again, I guess you could have some fun with it, so I'm gonna give this one a two. Game 10 is Food Fight for the 7800, originally released in 1987. I had a 7800 for quite some time. I decided when I was selling my collection, I couldn't decide if I wanted to sell it or not. Ultimately, I did, because really there were two games on the 7800 that I wanted to keep because I love these two games, and Food Fight was one of those games. So Food Fight was one of the determining factors in why I really wanted to get the Evercade because it had a Food Fight on the 7800. And basically you just, it's a single screen game. Your character's on the right side, you run to the left side to get the melting ice cream cone before it completely melts. But there's a whole bunch of chefs in your way, but there's piles of food everywhere. So you run over the piles of food, throw them at the shelves, the chefs pick them up, throw them at you, and you have to avoid getting hit, get points, and then you make it, eat the ice cream, and move on to the next level. I find this game fantastic. I really like it. It's one of my favorite arcade games. It was one of my favorite games on a 700. I can't say enough about it. I'm giving this one a five.
Game 11 is Gravatar for the 2600, originally released in 1983. And if I had to describe this game, it's kind of like Asteroids meets Lunar Lander. And that is not a bad combination at all. Basically, you start on a screen, you're kind of floating, you have to make it to these planets. Once you make it to the planet, the screen changes and you're kind of in a Lunar Lander type mode. You have to destroy the turrets and then pick up the items on the ground and move on to the next planet. It's a simple concept. I found this game to be really, really addicting and I, I forgot all about it. I even have this game and I forgot about how good it was. And there are actually five different game types, but if you didn't know that, the first game type is just the standard game. But the other game types really allow you to practice because sometimes you get more ships, sometimes the enemies don't even fire at you, and sometimes you don't even have to deal with the gravity. But really, for me, game one is where it's at. It's really intense, you have to have precise movements. Fantastic game. Five all the way on this one. Game number 12 is Missile Command for the 2600, originally released in 1981. This is a game I remember having as a kid, and I remember not really liking it as a kid because it was a game where you just felt doomed all the time. But you know what? That's part of the game. Now this is a port from the arcade game and the two major changes is that one, you're not using the track ball and that's fine. This game kind of works just as well with a joystick, but also you only have to control one missile silo instead of three. So in a way, the 2600 version is a simpler version of the arcade game and that's fine too. I like the idea of just controlling one missile silo. It works very well here. And basically you shoot missiles to defend yourself from incoming missiles. I guess you it's a war and you are just defending those cities. You're trying to explode those missiles before they could take out those cities or the silos. And there's other things that pop up on the screen, planes and there's smart bombs or whatever. But this is just a rock solid game any way you look at it. I'd say the 2600 version, despite being a lesser port of the arcade version is still just as much fun. This game is just fantastic and it still plays fantastic on the Evercade. The only downside here was with the Evercade version, you have 34 different game variations. And the only way you're gonna know what they are is if you look that up outside of the game. Uh, the manual itself for the Evercade doesn't list them out, but I printed myself out a little cheat sheet, threw it in the case. And really the only thing you have to know is that the first 17 games are one player, but it is helpful to know which variables are changed in which game variation. But yeah, Missile Command, fantastic game on the 2600 and I'm giving this a five here. Game 13 is Motor Psycho for the 7800, originally released in 1990. This is a game I'd never played before. And once I started playing it, I was crashing constantly. So I was like, I don't know if I really like this game. But you know what? I played it a bit and I started really getting the hang of it. The thing about this game you have to get used to is that there's no brake button in the game. You've got accelerate. And for some reason, the second button is a jump button. I honestly think they could have done away with the jump button because there's really not much to jump over, I feel. I feel like you get around that. The only reason I used the jump button was when you were taking really high hills and I thought, oh, let's see how far I could jump, woohoo! But you really can't do that in uh, the later tracks because you'll just jump off the track and explode anyway. But instead you can gear up and gear down and when you take those turns, you've got to gear down and release the accelerator to get to the appropriate speed. But once you get the hang of it, you could really play this game. The only thing you got to be careful of are is touching anything because you'll just explode like two bikers bump into each other and you'll explode like you're carrying nitroglycerin or something. But yeah, I really, really enjoyed this game. I mean, it's not perfect. It could have some tweaks to make it better, but still I found this really enjoyable. I'm giving this a four. Game 14 is Night Driver for the 2600, released in 1978. 
And I know there are people out there that are a fan of this game. I'm just not one of them. I find this game very uninteresting. And maybe it's because I didn't grow up with this game. It is a port of an arcade game. And I actually like the arcade game quite a bit. But this port, even on the 2600 with the paddle, I don't really enjoy that much. And this Evercade version takes away the paddle control, which means you have to steer with a D-pad. And I don't know if I'd consider it to be done very well. It's very incredibly difficult to steer. Now, again, I haven't played the original 2600 with the paddle in quite some time, but this feels very difficult. It's just a game where you can see how far you could get in a 90 second time period. And again, you've got different game versions and games one through four are increasingly difficult track, except for four, which is a completely random style track where you don't know what you're going to get. But the game just ends after 90 seconds. And then the rest of the games are the same games repeated, except there's no time limit, which means you just drive until you get completely, utterly bored, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just not a big fan of this one at all. I'm not going to give it a one because I still feel there could be some fun to be had with it. So I'm just going to leave this one as a two. Game 15 is Ninja Golf for the 7800, originally released in 1990. Now, remember back when I was talking about Food Fight and I said there were two games that were preventing me from selling the 7800 and one of them was Food Fight? Well, the other one was Ninja Golf. And that's just because it's a, just such an unusual game. Is it a golf game? Is it a ninja fighting game? Well, it's both. You line up your tee shot, you aim, you shoot, and then you have to run to your ball. But while you're running to your ball, you have to fight off other ninjas and various other animals. And I guess it depends on the environment. There's the fairway, which is the easiest of them all. But then if you have to run through the rough, then you've got different creatures. If you shoot over water, then you'll have to go under the water and fight off sharks and such. And then once you get to the green, you have to throw shurikens at a dragon until you defeat it and then move on to the next hole. This game does have some issues though. I don't know why you can't do a jump kick. If you jump and try to attack, instead you throw a shuriken in the air if you have one. And overall, there's just some weird janky stuff that goes on. And I feel that if this was fine tuned just a little bit more, this game would be so much more fun to play. I want to give this one a five for the concept and how much I like it, but I have to give it a four because this one could use a little bit more work before it was released. Game 16 is Steeplechase for the 2600 originally released in 1980. And the concept of this one is very simple. You are riding a horse in a race with three other players and you just jump the obstacles until you reach the end. The further the leader gets down the screen, the faster everybody goes. So basically this is just a game where you hit the button and jump and just time it. And that would be great and everything, but in the original 2600 version, you use the paddle controller to adjust the height of your jump. And if you jump lower, you would hit the ground sooner and gain some speed on some people. So there was a little bit more strategy here, but in the Evercade version, they've removed the panel controls completely. So you're stuck always doing a high jump. And that puts you at a disadvantage over all the other computer controlled opponents because they can adjust it. So you can still beat the computer on difficulties where they're not very smart, but you have no chance of winning against a higher intelligent opponent because they are going to be able to outperform you. Also, this game is really set up for four people. So this is the type of game that would be more fun against other players and here on the Evercade version, you're stuck not really being able to play against anybody, just the computer. And it's just a double whammy on this game. You can't play against other people and you can't adjust the height of your jump like you could in the original. I could very easily give this game a one, but to be fair, you could still have some fun just timing those jumps if you just leave it at that. So I'm just going to give this one a two. Game 17 is Sword Quest Earthworld, originally released for the 2600 in 1982. And this game, I don't know why this is on the Evercade at all. 
And why just Earthworld? Why not the other two games that were released in this series? Basically, this is an adventure type game where when this was released, there was a prize involved. But you can't just plug this game in and play it. It requires that you have the actual manual and that you have a, the comic book that came with the game as well. Because as you play the game, you have to reference that in order to solve the puzzle. And it's also not like this puzzle changes every time you play it. Once you solve the game, you're done. If you play it again, it's going to be exactly the same thing again. The thing is that I like games that are pick up and play. This is not a pick up and play game. This requires doing research and solving puzzles outside of the game that requires more documentation than you get with the Evercade. And the documentation they give you in the manual for Sword Quest Earthworld is half a page, not nearly enough to get you even started with this game. Sure, you could run around, pick up items in the game, drop them down and figure out how to unlock doors and play the weird little mini games, but really it's not worth it at all. I'm giving this game a one. Not worth playing at all on the Evercade. Game 18 is Tempest for the Atari 2600. I would say this was released in 1984, but again, this is another prototype. But is it a good prototype like AquaVenture? No, this is a prototype that barely resembles Tempest at all. I don't even know why Tempest was even attempted on the Atari 2600, and I don't know why this prototype wound up on this Atari collection. It is bad. The graphics on the screen are just really just that. It's just a static graphic. Your ship and the enemies don't align to those graphics at all. Shots disappeared. You'll get hit by invisible bullets. This game, if they did intend for it to release on the 2600, still had a lot of work that needed to be done to it. And this is just not worth playing at all. I don't know why they thought this would be a good addition to this collection. I'm giving this a one flat out. I don't like it. Not playing it again. Game 19 is a video pinball for the 2600 released in 1980. And this was one of my favorite games growing up. I played this one a lot. And moreover, this was kind of my inspiration for getting into the whole video pinball thing. So of course I was looking forward to playing this on the Evercade. And you know what? It works fairly well. Aside from the fact that if you hit the left bumper, you'll accidentally activate difficulty A which is some sort of oversight. There's not even supposed to be a way to trigger those switches. So if you accidentally hit it, the only way to get it back to normal is to exit back to the menu and load the game again. But also the instructions they give you in the booklet don't even mention that you can hold the fire button to nudge the ball in the game. Just don't nudge too much because you will tilt. But yeah, I mean, it really doesn't look like a pinball machine, but the game is still fun. It's still one of my favorites and I'm giving this one a five. And finally, game 20 is Yars Return for the 2600, released in 2005. Why so late? Well, this is not really an original 2600 release. This originally came out on one of the Atari flashbacks, but this is really just a hack of Yars Revenge, and I find it very bizarre that they didn't put Yars Revenge on this, but instead they put this one on Collection 1 and Yars Revenge in Collection 2. So if you were to pop in this game and start playing it without knowing how to play it, you wouldn't have a clue. So basically you're a Yar and your job is to kind of break down the barrier for the thing in the center of the screen. And once you do that, you can load up a missile and fire it across the screen. And once you defeat it, you move on to the next level where it's a different type of barrier. And then it just kind of alternates back and forth. Uh, the weird pattern thing on the outside of the screen is the safe zone. You can't fire from that zone, but the little bits that are following you around the screen can't hurt you either in those areas. The problem with Yars Return is that there is very little space on the screen to maneuver and fire because everything is taking up so much of the screen since everything was moved to the center and, and kind of mirrored 
from what you saw in Yar's Revenge. And that, to me, makes this far less desirable to play than Yar's Revenge. Yar's Revenge is an excellent game, but they've modified this in a way that makes me not want to play it. So I'm going to give this a two because it's not totally terrible, but it's not really something I'd like to play either. So that's it for Atari Collection 1. Half the games, 10 out of the 20 games, I gave either a uh, 5 or a 4 to. So I think half the collection is just fantastic on this thing. Uh, now, six of them I gave a mass score where some fun could still be had, and two of them I just find plain bad, and there's no reason to go back to play them at all. Plus, I may have mentioned this, but um, but you really don't know what the game selects are in a lot of the Atari 2600 games, so you kind of have to come up with a cheat seat sheet of that. Perhaps that should have been included in the cartridge or the manual or whatever. But really, I think this is a solid collection, and if you average all the scores I've given all 20 of these games, it comes out to 3.25. And the reason I'm doing this is for future use. I kind of want to see how this stacks up against any of the other collections I get. And I feel like maybe doing an average of all the games included may be the best way to go about that. So thanks for watching. See you all next time.